Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Bill Mishner. I'm the PI and Project Director for New Mexico EBSCOR. And we scheduled an hour and a half for this, but I think it'll probably take about an hour or less. Uh, that's been the trend thus far. But we will certainly take questions throughout. The, um, the reason for this is there have been some uh, big changes, <clears throat> excuse me, with respect to federal agencies in terms of how they are treating and data products uh, associated with funded U.S. research. And <clears throat> on March 27th, excuse me, my allergies are kicking in here. On March 27th, uh, we received a dear colleague letter from the National Science Foundation, and it's available publicly. Uh, it's NSF 20-068, if any of you want to go read it yourself. But uh, it's an open science for research data, dear colleague letter. And this indicates, uh, again, some major changes within the NSF uh, and likely other foundation, uh, other federal agencies are, will be jumping on board as well. But let me just read these parts of three paragraphs to sort of set the stage for today's uh, webinar. Um, so starting here, uh, in alignment with the benefits of open science, NSF is undertaking an expansion of its public access repository, NSF PAR, to include metadata records about the research data that supports the journal and jury conference preceding manuscripts resulting from NSF funded research. The metadata records about the research data will contain sufficient information to allow for data discovery and an access determination to be made, but not necessarily all the metadata uh, required for reuse of the research data. Research data will have a digital object identifier that was assigned to it prior to being reported to NSF. The research data will not reside in NSF PAR, but will instead reside in a repository, data center, or data portal managed by an organization that is committed to ensuring the availability of the data over time. The anticipated location of research data associated with publication, if known, can be identified in the data management plan and budgeted in the proposal. Uh, research data in support of a publication are one, the data necessary to confirm the validity of the scientific result reported in the publication, and two, the data described by the publication, or three, as specified by the journal or conference proceeding. Uh, Complementing the publication, the metadata record about research data in support of a publication will, as does the publication, become part of the public record on the NSF website, the scientific contributions of an award. <clears throat> so this is um, uh, in process of being implemented at NSF. Um, initially, things are mandatory, but over the next few weeks, we anticipate that we will see some uh, very hard and fast rules coming down from NSF and the groups or projects that are most likely to be evaluated first are the large projects like EBSCOR projects, which are $20 million in size. So we need to essentially be getting our data products and these are data underlying the research findings and again, peer reviewed articles or juried conference proceeding manuscripts. And these all data products all need to have DOIs and they need to be deposited in a community recognized repository. Uh, fortunately, we have the uh, capacity to provide all of that to all of you, stu your students, yourselves, uh, and anyone associated with the project, we can provide a DOI and we can archive or preserve the key data that are underlying uh, manuscripts and conference proceedings in a community-based uh, repository. So what we're gonna do today is first, uh, Carl Benedict and John Wheeler will be going over uh, some of the tools and services that can be provided in order to expedite and I think make it quite 
quite painless and fairly easy to do this. And then secondly, we will hear uh, from Deanna Dugas at New Mexico State University about the high performance computing capabilities that we have available through EPSCoR and we can provide, uh, again, easy access to those high performance computing uh, facilities as well as uh, consulting and other services that might be necessary to translate code or uh, get your jobs up and running on the new hardware that we purchased as part of EPSCoR. So without further ado, I'm going to go on mute um, probably cut my video off and turn it over to Carl and John, and then after which uh, Deanna will take over and cover the high performance computing. So I encourage you to uh, stay throughout the entire meeting and we'll take questions throughout and as well as at the end. So thank you and it's all yours, Carl. Great, uh, hopefully uh, you can see my screen. And uh, I wanted to start out um, highlighting uh, the information you can go to anytime as a refresher for what we're going to be talking about today. And it's the two critical items that relate to data management and both our um, plan for how we're going to um, manage, document, and share the data products that are coming out of the project. That's our data management plan. But then also a reference document that um, John and I produced that uh, provides a more detailed step-by-step -step process for um, getting registered with and submitting um, data sets into uh, the Dryad repository as one part of our overall um, data preservation and sharing plan. So I was going to start out here on the EBSCoR site um, and highlight that if you go into the resources and then team member resources, on the page that will come up, you can scroll down to the section on high performance computing and data management. And in that section, you'll find um, the link to NMSU's um, uh, webpage that, uh, that Deanna will be um, highlighting um, the components of in terms of getting set up and being able to use the high performance computing resource that we have. But in the context of what John and I will be talking about, there's also a link to the project data management plan that provides the um, more detailed information about exactly what we committed to NSF in terms of the types of data, the types of documentation we would provide, and how what our strategy would be for actually providing access to those data um, and that documentation, um, both during and beyond the life of the project. Um, and then there's a second document, the data management workflow, that um, highlights um, how to get set up and how to work through the process of um, actually uh, uh, submitting data uh, for uh, preservation and discovery and access in the um, platform that we have for public access, which is uh, Dryad. One of potentially any number of repositories that would be appropriate for your data. Um, and if Dryad is um, uh, less appropriate than say a disciplinary repository um, that is specific to the type of data you're generating, um, we can work with you on identifying those additional disciplinary repositories and work with you on um, being able to get your data into those repositories as well. Today we'll be focusing on um, Dryad and the workflow for um, getting content into the Dryad repository as the one that we have um, direct access to uh, through the support of the EPSCoR program. Um, having said that, I'm going to now switch over to the Dryad homepage. So Dryad is um, a data repository that is um, managed by and for um, a broader community of organizations that are focused on um, long-term data um, discovery, access, and preservation. Um, through our funds from the EBSCoR project, we have been able to um, uh, set up an institutional membership with Dryad that um, EBSCoR is funding over the course of the EBSCoR project. And we're working at UNM 
to um, ultimately identify uh, an additional strategy for being able to continue that institutional membership beyond the life of the EBSCOR project. And part of that is actually demonstrating the value and impact of the data products that are going into the repository. Um, the Dryad Institutional Repository model is based on affiliation with individual institutions. So in, in this case, the institutional membership is um, through the University of New Mexico. But since the Data One project is um, essentially administered uh, from, uh, from the University of New Mexico, um, all of our EBSCOR researchers have access to the benefits of this institution of membership. Um, the most significant one being um, that we are able to um, add uh, data sets to the repository without paying an additional deposit fee. Uh, folks that do not have an institutional membership or who are not working through an existing publisher agreement with Dryad actually have to pay to deposit their um, data into Dryad. But through our membership, that fee, that fee is waived. Um, the one uh, uh, caveat is that since this institutional membership is linked to the University of New Mexico, um, there are two paths for being able to get content into the repository. If you are a UNM um, uh, staff, student, or faculty member, um, you can um, log in to uh, Dryad using your UNM email address um, credentials and you can potentially um, add your own content into Dryad um, by virtue of those UNM credentials. If you are not a student staff or faculty member at UNM, um, you would need to work with uh, John or myself uh, to work with you to get uh, content deposited into Dryad. It's just, a, it's an artifact of the way they have structured their institutional membership and how you can log in. The login process is very simple, um, and the preferred method is through a, um, an ORCID. Um, and if you don't already have an ORCID, which is a unique identifier um, for each of us as a researcher that allows us to link that identifier to the data sets that we produce, the papers that we publish, the grants that we uh, submit and, and uh, receive, um, it allows for um, unambiguous identification of us as uh, individual contributors and, um, and developers of, of products so we can get the credit that we deserve for all of that work. And it's um, easier to actually um, track down and um, uh, categorize and collect the products that we're uh, generating. So if you can log in, in this case, um, I'm just gonna click on the login or create your um, ORCID ID. And I've already gone through this process, so I have, I've already linked my, my ORCID account, in this case it's a personal account, um, and my uh, email address, and I've already established a password in ORCID, and they're using ORCID to authenticate me, uh, and I'm saying sign into ORCID, and now I'm logged into the system. And I can see then any data sets that I have in progress in addition to data sets that I've submitted. Um, I'm going to open up one of these existing data sets that I've started in one of our other workshops to show you an example of what the submission workflow looks like in terms of the information that is needed to um, essentially uh, document a data set and then upload it into Dryad for review by the Dryad curators before it is um, actually uh, published. The information that is needed is provided on this first describe your data set screen, where you first can link it to either a manuscript that's in progress, an article that has already been published. So if you have data that are associated with existing publications, you can absolutely add those to the system as well. Um, or if it is being submitted for other, some other reason where it isn't necessarily associated with a publication now, but you still want or need to be able to um, make it publicly accessible and obtain a DOI, a digital object identifier, and a stable citation for it, you can still um, upload your data. It's not required that it be associated with a publication. 
you need to then provide some basic information about the data set, giving it a descriptive title, providing information about the authorship, who contributed to the development of that data set, preferably again with associated ORCIDs. Um, uh, Dryad requires an ORCID for the first author. ORCIDs are optional for the additional authors, but as I was saying earlier, there are significant benefits um, for you to establish and maintain your ORCID and use that identifier uh, wherever you can so that you can continue to um, essentially uh, build and, and, uh, and establish your, your record that's easy to track and find. Um, there's also then after the authorship, the addition of a descriptive abstract for your data set. This is, you know, just as you would with a journal article, this is the first thing that folks that are potentially going to be considering um, the reuse of your data set, this is the first thing that they're going to look at in terms of information about the data set or the collection of data that you're uploading. You then have some additional descriptive fields for the data set, um, including a set of keywords and we can work with you on identifying an appropriate source for those keywords because we would preferably like to draw those keywords from um, an existing uh, collection of terms that are appropriate for your discipline as terms that would likely be used by other researchers trying to find your data set. Um, a narrative description of the methods that were used to generate the data set. Um, how are they collected? How are they processed? Those, that sort of information. There's an additional um, uh, field for usage notes. This relates more to the effective use of the data. So what is the structure? What are the formats? Um, what is the data dictionary? Essentially the description of, say if you're working with a tabular data set, what are the column names and what values do they contain? What are the units? This is critical information for actually uh, transitioning from your data being findable for it to actually be reusable. And John will talk a minute about, in just a minute about FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable as objectives that we are aiming for. But it's this documentation that we're providing here that is critical for hitting all of those, all of those points in um, documenting the data sets. Um, there's a critical element here in adding information about uh, related to funding. We want to make sure, uh, coming back to the Dear Colleague letter that Bill was just discussing, um, that the project gets credit for the data sets that have been created and shared. And by linking information about our NSF award, that it was from NSF and the award number, that streamlines the process of being able to capture and report any of the data sets that um, are being produced by the project. If we're adding um, data sets to other repositories, we would be doing the same thing, making sure that we are capturing information about those data sets for our own records, but also adding to the data sets in those other repositories information about the granting organization, as that is um, one way that essentially the uh, uh, statistics for uh, compliance with the requirements for data sharing uh, get developed. And then there is also this uh, section being able to um, uh, capture information about related works. So this may be uh, relationships, citation relationships with other data sets that may have been used to feed into and contributed to the generation of a data set. There may be additional publications. There may be a data publication that has been published in a journal related to this data set as well. It's in this relationship section that you can add um, items that are related. You can see it, there are many different ways to uh, characterize what that relationship is. Once you've provided all of this information, um, you can then go through the process, and I won't go through that here, of uploading one or more data sets that are associated with the submission, and then ultimately you, su you submit um, the, uh, the data set for uh, review by the, by the curators at Dryad. Um, this is hopefully following work with us, uh, John and myself, 
um, to make sure that your, your data are already well documented, that the documentation you've produced is complete and al well aligned with your data that are also well structured and organized so that they, we again maximize that potential impact of, of your data. Um, as soon as you actually um, have submitted it for that, that review process, uh, you get a preliminary DOI or a provisional DOI. So you're then able to know that once it has gone through that review process and is published, you will know what the identifier for that, that data set is. So you can start referring to it in say a draft publication that you're submitting for review um, as an increasing number of publishers are requiring that you demonstrate that the data are in a repository somewhere with an associated identifier like a DOI. Um, there's also a link once you have um, essentially got, initiated that submission process that you can share with reviewers or uh, publishers um, so that, that uh, there can be preliminary access to the data set while it's still going through review for reviewers of a publication. So there is a, essentially an early access opportunity for data sets if you need that before they even go public. But this is basically the simplified workflow that, um, that we have through the website. Um, John and I are also working on ways to streamline sort of bulk processing and bulk uploads into the system for large collections of data or, um, or, uh, or, or multiple data sets as part of a, as part of a, um, a larger uh, research activity. And this is where, again, I wanna come back to contact us early in your research work um, so that we can help develop a strategy for being able to cross the finish line with data sets going into the repository um, as smoothly and easily as possible in terms of having the documentation at hand, having it well structured and organized, having the data well organized and, um, and understandable and reusable as they go through the research process so that um, this, this last stage of being able to get it into our preservation and sharing system is a very smooth and easy process. Um, and I'll take any questions while um, I change over and make John the host so that he can continue with some additional information about, um, about uh, Dryad. Okay, John, you're now the host. Great, thank you. Okay, and so what I wanna do is show a little more about how things look after a data set has been submitted to Dryad and use an existing published data set to demonstrate some of the sort of data-friendly features that Dryad offers as repository. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. So. Uh, one of the things, uh, oh, sorry, okay. And so, yeah, Dryad is a data repository, which gives it some features that distinguish it from, for example, a document-oriented repository, like our institutional repository. Um, and that includes, uh, as uh, part of the upload process and part of the data set creation process, there's two ways that you can import your data into Dryad. Uh, there's a desktop method which allows you to upload up to 10 gigabytes per data set. If you have large data sets, there is sort of a server to server uh, option that allows you to upload up to 300 gigabytes. Uh, so there's a lot of variability and a lot of flexibility and we can definitely assist researchers in setting up um, the, the server to server communication and, and uh, system that's necessary in order to upload those larger data sets into Dryad. Uh, but a couple of things here, there's the ORCIDs that Carl was talking about. Again, that creates a link between the researchers and uh, the, the data, uh, unambiguous link. We do have some colleagues on this data set that we published who uh, do not have ORCIDs or didn't provide their ORCIDs. So as Carl noted, it's really only required for the first author. Uh, but a couple of things I want to show is that this data set is fairly large-ish. It's about six gigabytes and using the upload feature from the desktop, uh, it only took a few minutes and I was uploading, I think, 
10 to 12 files at a time. So the system has a really robust backend for getting the data into Dryad. Uh, it's fast, it's pretty painless. There's version support where we had two versions of this data set, one in November and one uh, an update that was released in January. And um, a, being able to, to update the data files and to add new data files, let us create a, a second version of this data set without changing the DOI. So that's a great feature because if you've shared that DOI with your colleagues, you've shared it with publishers, uh, you can make changes to the data set and the DOI itself doesn't change. So you don't have to go back and, and reshare that. There's also this data publication that gets created, which is sort of a best practice on the data curation side of things. And where it's valuable is, first of all, that PDF is something that can be added to dossiers and so forth uh, as you're moving through promotion and tenure. But also to give you a look at what our data publication looks like for this data set, um, this is something that makes the way Google Scholar works and the Google Search Index works, uh, a lot of the, the indexing is done on the PDFs rather than the, the page level metadata. And so having this document here that includes all of the metadata and links to a data set actually makes your data more discoverable. So that is a nice feature uh, that Dryad offers. And again, metrics, we can see uh, right away how often the, the data set has been accessed and downloaded. And to come back to something Carl was saying, we do have this descriptive metadata that's required when you create uh, a data submission. Uh, but in addition, to come back to this idea of fair data, uh, to make data findable, accessible, uh, interoperable, and reusable, um, it's most helpful for your colleagues and other professionals in the field to have access to this information about methods and how the data were collected. Um, uh, any limitations on the data, data processing steps that, that you went through in order to, to get the data from the raw state into the published state. Uh, we have some definition of terms here, how we created uh, CSV files from it. Uh, as Carl mentioned, a data dictionary for the, the tabular data that are in the published data set uh, is very helpful and important for the, 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 the published data and to help people use it. And what we'll see in the, the metadata template that I'm going to share in a minute, um, when we added this to our data set, we basically took our existing documentation and just copied and pasted it uh, into uh, the Dryad data submission. And so with that, moving on to the template, if you contact us at rds at unm.edu, uh, what we can do to help get your data into Dryad is set up a uh, shared folder on OneDrive. And within that shared folder, we'll have a spreadsheet that follows this uh, metadata template that we're looking at here. And it includes all of the required fields and the optional fields uh, that Carl described in the data set uh, submission process for Dryad. So for example, we have the title is required, uh, the author one, and all that required information. And we see that author one also, uh, there is an ORCID required for that person. Uh, and then for additional authors, author two, author three, uh, this information, name, email, and institution are required. If there is a second author, it's required. If there is a third author, so name, email, and institution are required for every author. Uh, if you use this template, you'll see it looks just like this in the spreadsheet version, and you can simply um, add additional author information uh, as needed by, by adding the, the corresponding rows. Keyword, uh, a space is provided for keywords. Again, we recommend using controlled vocabulary terms and that's something that Carl and I can assist with. For methods and usage notes, uh, do please feel free to upload relevant documents as appropriate. Like I said, in the example that I just showed, we had all that documentation uh, in project documentation and when we went to publish the data, it was just a matter of copying and pasting it. So if you have lab notebooks, if you have SOPs, any information that's relevant to how the data are collected and processed, uh, if you share that with us, we can help you get that uh, in a, in a uh, appropriate usable fashion into the, the data set record. Uh, funding information, again, if you have additional funding, it's recommended that you include that information, but by default, we have added the uh, current F-score grant number to the template. 
And again, there's space for the additional information about related works and location information that, that Carl described. So do please feel free to reach out to us at rds at unm.edu. We'll share that email in the, in the chat uh, to help get this process going. And I can also at this time take any questions while I hand it off to Diana. And I've already pasted the RDS email into the chat um, towards the top that's probably scrolled off a little bit now because there are some additional questions. Excellent. And Diana, you're the host. Thank you. Um, did everyone get their questions answered in the chat? All right. Hearing crickets, I'm going to assume yes. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get back to the page that I need to actually be on. All right. So. I am one of the information and communication technologies directors down at New Mexico State University. Um, I am also one of the main CI contacts for the entire EPSCOR project. And today I wanted to spend just a few minutes talking to you guys about some of the computational resources that the EPSCOR project helps support. So when the authors of the grant sat down, they realized that one of the things that would be necessary would be both computational resources and storage resources. So they did an incredible job and got you lots and lots of hardware that you can play with. Um, so that you guys just have a sense of it, the storage that you have access to is over 700 terabytes worth of open space right now. Um, that is oodles and oodles and oodles of storage space. And we know that you guys are producing data, right? We see lots of publications, so therefore there's gotta be data happening. Um, the storage system is backed up, so it makes a very, very convenient area to place your data. Um, because it means that unlike that hard drive that is stuck underneath your desk in the office that you're not allowed to go back to for who knows how long, um, this data is easily accessible to you. And again, it's backed up. So when you get back in the office and you try to start up that hard drive and it doesn't start, that backed up data that you had may or may not be um, reclaimable. The HPC attached storage, however, is. In addition to being backed up, I just said some very important words. It is HPC attached, which means that if your data is large, if you're planning on doing any sort of data analysis, it's already ready for you to use with the HPC. So you don't have to wait for your data to transfer. You don't have to worry about um, how long things are gonna take, whether or not there's enough space. There's space and it's ready and waiting for you. So if you do have analysis that you wanna do, what's available and how do you use it? So if you go over here, so right now I'm on the hpc.nmsc.edu webpage. Um, it's an incredibly easy URL to remember. Um, Carl did a wonderful job of showing you how to locate it on the EPSCoR website if you happen to forget, but simply Googling HPC and NMSU will also take you to this page. If you go under discovery and discovery details, it has information about the shape and size of our cluster. If you scroll down a little bit, you've got these three lines here that all talk about the EPSCoR hardware. So we have four dual GPU nodes, which means that there are two NVIDIA Tesla V100 GPUs on each one of those nodes. So that's a total of eight. Um, those GPU nodes can also simply be used as CPU nodes. 
So you don't have to have the ability to program on a GPU node. Your code doesn't have to be able to utilize GPU nodes in order to be run on this equipment. There are also two high memory nodes. Each one of these has three terabytes of memory. So if you have a large data set, for example, that needs to be in memory in order to be processed, um, you can use these nodes for that. It also works well if you have something that doesn't span well across nodes, but needs a lot of memory. And so you can use these as well. Okay, on this website, we also have a little EPSCoR tab. If we click on that, we've tried to make it relatively easy for people to get access to the system. This website, this web page, has a description of the resources available again, and then it tells you how to get an account. So you can either click on this link right here, or you can go under requests, account request. So both of these will take you to the same location. For simplicity's sake, we're going to go ahead and walk through this so that you know what to expect if and when you decide that you need to use the HPC. The first thing, of course, name first and last, university email and department. Um, if this is a non-NMSU email, please put it in as long as it's a university email. We really don't want to be communicating with Yahoo accounts, Gmail accounts, um, but at NMT, at NM you or at UNM, at NMSU, all of those are perfectly valid. Um, there's something about the sizing of my screen, so I'm going to apologize, but these buttons um, seem to be sitting on top of the words. It shouldn't be this way when you actually look at it on yours. There's something about um, relaying it through Zoom that's causing it to shift a little. So next we want to know your affiliation with NMSU. If you are an NMSU student, faculty, or staff, um, please select those and then notify us that you are an EPSCoR person so that you get access to the EPSCoR petition. If you are not an NMSU um, affiliate, right, or, EP, or if you are an EPSCoR person, go ahead and click on this button. And what you noticed is that we had this line sort of pop out. So the HPC is behind a firewall on um, the NMSU campus. So in order to access it from off campus, you have to go through the VPN. This is a standard and easy thing for any, anyone that has an NMSU email. But if you don't, we need you to fill out this HPC VPN form so that we can get your right, you, access to the HPC. We're going to take a little offshoot here and look at what this VPN form looks like. As the requester, right, if I'm at UNM, I fill out section one. So it's relatively standard, name, employer, email address. For the reason for temporary access, simply stating something like, I'm a part of EPSCoR, or EPSCoR analysis, anything with the word EPSCoR in it is fine. We don't need a dissertation on what it exactly is that you're going to be using the system for. Um, you're going to see this language again in a little bit when we finish filling out the account request, but we have a data use agreement. And this is incredibly important because the NMSU supercomputing cluster is not a secure system. So any data that is sensitive in any way, shape, or form should not be found on the system. However, we do not go into your home, right? We don't go into your directories. We don't look at your home directory, your scratch directory. We don't look in your files to try to figure out whether or not these files contain anything that is sensitive. It's on you to make sure that your files um, obey this particular language, right? So if, if it is something that contains sensitive data, please reach out to us. We'll try to find you a different system that you can run that is secure. Um, but 
this language means that you are the one responsible for ensuring that your files do not contain any sensitive information. Um, section 2.1, the non-NMSU sponsor information. So as a part of EPSCOR, um, I have talked with Ann Yuckel and she is um, going to be the person who fills in this particular section out. So once you filled out the first part and signed and dated um, the user agreement part of it, simply send this form off to Ann. She will verify that you are somebody who's listed as an EBSCO affiliate. Um, and then she will fill out this section and go ahead and send it on to me. Because we are all EBSCOR, I then am the NMSU sponsor, and I will also fill out this last section. So once it gets over to me, it should go incredibly fast. Um, the onus really is on you to get it to Anne as quickly as possible so she can turn around and send it back to me. So we filled out our HPC VPN form. I've gone ahead and sent it off to Anne. And now I'm back to filling out my account request. So again, under research description, we don't need a dissertation. Um, simply putting EPSCOR research works. Next, we wanna ask you a couple of questions. So have you ever used Linux or Unix? Yes or no? If I click yes. Um, the next question that pops up is, have you ever used a high performance compute cluster? If I again answer yes, it asks me a little bit more about um, the different types of information that I'm gonna need in order to use the cluster. Answering yes, answering no doesn't matter. It's not a test for you. It's not to, right, this information won't be used to determine whether or not you will gain access. You will gain access. Um, these questions are simply there so that we know sort of where your base level of knowledge is and what it is that we need to make sure to convey to you before you become a user on the system. Before anyone is able to actually log into the system, we request that you either take the Canvas course or have a one-on-one, -on -one, in this case, a Zoom meeting with one of the HPC team members. From there, we're gonna go ahead and teach you everything that you need to know. So if you're not even sure what Linux or Unix are, we can help. We will start by telling you what, what those words mean, how to navigate in that particular system and build upon those skills to teach you how to actually use the system itself, how to submit jobs, how to get software um, loaded into your environment, how to request additional software, we're here to help. Um, so regardless of whether or not you know what any of these words mean, by the time you're done with onboarding, you will know and hopefully feel comfortable with it. At the same time, we are not going anywhere. Um, the students are still very active in helping the NMSU community. The HBC admins and I are a part of the HPC team as well. Um, we have no plans on going anywhere. And so once you're done with onboarding, if you've realized that you've forgotten something, if you realize that you need help um, writing a script, uh, if you realize that you have a script that runs great on your laptop desktop, but suddenly doesn't seem to run on the HPC, if you wanna optimize something, if you wanna try to convert your um, regular processing um, analysis script to something that can be run on a GPU, right? We're here for all of that. Um, we have multiple ways that you can contact us, which I'll go over in a little bit. Um, but if you have any questions, there is no question too big, too small um, for us to answer. We do it all day and we're quite, we rather enjoy it. So continuing to scroll down, we have the data use agreement. Again, this should be very familiar. We just filled it out, or we just agreed to this on the VPN form. But again, it says, I will not um, store or use sensitive or regulated data on the system. Um, 
something that everybody should probably do once a week at this point is verify that you are not a robot. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm not sleeping so great and the days are starting to blur. So sometimes it's nice to have this little checkbox tell me that I am not a robot. Once that's done, um, you should be contacted within 24 hours by somebody on the HPC team to remind you what your next steps are. So if um, you are somebody who is outside of NMSU, we'll try to remind you to get that HPC VPN form filled out and sent off to Anne. Um, and we will contact you to see if you want to schedule a sort of in-person, as in-person as we get nowadays, um, meeting with an HPC member for onboarding or if you'd like to be added to the Canvas course. Um, if you need us, you can go under help contact us and we have a form that's available here for you to fill out. However, if you go under help and office hours, we also have the HPC team email listed right there. Um, if you email that hpc-team at nmsu.edu, it will reach four graduate students, um, two HPC admins, and myself. So somebody is generally available to help within a short time frame. Um, one thing that I've sort of skimmed over entirely here is why should you be interested in this? Um, especially with the COVID-19 keeping everybody out of offices, right, out of labs. Um, most people are at home with systems that are a little, if not underpowered, at least less powerful than what they had while they were on campus. The HPC is a very, very powerful resource. Um, so if you're finding yourself sitting at home and the analysis that you used to be able to run in the lab that would take an hour is now taking five hours on your laptop, come talk to us. We can help. If you're finding yourself having difficulty loading all of the data that you need to analyze onto your laptop, right, your hard drive is getting full, contact us. We can help. Um, it's really just a giant computer that you log into in order to run your data analysis. So again, even if all you've ever done is run it on your laptop and you have no idea how you could possibly take advantage of the HPC, contact us. We'd love to help get you onto the system and using it well. Um, one other thing that we are currently working on so UNM and NMSU is working on a shared um, storage space where if files are dropped within this particular directory, they will be mirrored, mirrored between UNM and NMSU. So if you happen to be a UNM um, researcher and those systems are more familiar to you, you're more comfortable using them, there's time available on them, right? feel free to move your data into that particular directory. It will be mirrored and you can easily bounce back and forth between the CAR-C resources and the NMSU resources. The entire goal of this side of the project is to make your lives easier and to support you in doing the analysis that you need. So the over 700 terabytes of storage that we have, Right, that's a great place to keep your data, keep your data files, keep all of your metadata, keep your scripts, keep everything that hopefully you've already talked to Carl and John about how to get those things into the repository and what information you need to be tracking for the repository. But even if you wait until the end to talk to them, this is a great place for you to keep that data. It will be up, it will be running, it will be supported, and it will be easily accessible by everyone inside of the team. Um, that being said, everyone does have their own independent space, which means I can't necessarily see um, what Carl is doing on the HPC. However, we have project space where he and I can collaborate. So there's, there's a million different ways of using the system. If you are at all interested, please contact us. 
let us know. Um, and again, we're here to help. With that, I'm going to stop sharing and see if anyone has any questions. Uh, good morning. This is, this is Caetano da Silva from New Mexico Tech. I, I have a very uh, quick question, which is, uh, are these resources available for researchers that are not connected to the specific, uh, this is specific New Mexico EPSCoR grant? For example, if I have a student funded on a separate grant, can he or she still use uh, the HPC resources at NMSU? So that's a great question. Um, Usually there has to be an agreement with a researcher on the NMSU campus in order for your student to have access to those resources. Um, if that isn't the case, we do also have regional resources and national resources that are also free for use. Um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna put my email address here into the chat. Um, send me an email. And if you don't have an NMSU researcher that we can put on as a collaboration or as a collaborator, um, I would be more than happy to give you access to my Exceed allocation, which is the national resource. Um, it's a collection of, oh God, six, I think six, um, incredibly large um, HPCs. And so you can see which one of those would be best for you and your student to use. Um, I'm happy to help you try to figure out which one would be best because they have various amounts of software and different amounts of support. Um, there's also the regional supercomputer um, called Summit, not to be confused with the top 500 supercomputer. Um, but it's, it's located on the University of Colorado's campus and we have access to that as well. So, um, right, I and at least one of the HPC admins are campus champions, so we can help you get access to the Exceed resources. Um, and I and Patrick um, are a part of the RMAC consortium, right, the Rocky Mountain Advanced Computing Consortium. And so we can help you get access to the regional resources as well. As well. They're available. You just have to reach out. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And as I've said in chat, the same, the same policy applies for the UNM resources. Um, if you have a UNM researcher you're working with, you can, um, on the project, we can get you access to the, the supercomputing systems at UNM and the associated storage, which is mirrored, as Deanna said, with New Mexico State. And likewise, we can also help you with national resources too. So. And on a different topic, um, I would uh, extend the comments I was making um, in the chat regarding um, access to the Dryad system. Um, and our strong recommendation that um, even if you um, can or are directly submitting content to either Dryad or another repository, um, please get in touch with us at rds at unm.edu um, because we're also trying to keep track of the various data um, resources that are being created by the project. And we are also uh, working on making sure that those data are also getting into our preservation system, something that, that we didn't highlight earlier, which is essentially a dark archive that is uh, managed specifically for keeping um, the data safe um, for long term. And that is uh, designed specifically for making sure that the um, data re, um, remain viable, intact, and that uh, over the longer run, if necessary, uh, can have uh, formats migrated to supported formats in the future. Um, so please even reach out to us even if you have already or if you are uh, directly placing your data into another repository just so we can make sure that we're also getting it preserved through the other part of our uh, sharing and preservation system that we have for the project.
Any other questions or comments from folks? Uh, Caetano da Silva from New Mexico Tech here again. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you, Bill, uh, mostly about, about, uh, about the logistics here. So the first one is, um, so Dryad is the recommended solution, but not the required one. Could I, could I, could I use something else? And the second question is, uh, if we are supposed to also upload papers to this type of, uh, uh, you know, journal articles to this type of databases, how do we deal with, you know, with, uh, with the publisher's copyright issues and it, it, those, type of, those type of restrictions? Uh, well, with respect to linking papers to the NSFR system, I don't think there's any publisher that prevents that from happening. Uh, this is a legal requirement, and I think uh, all of the publishers have uh, you know, agreed to do that with NSF. Uh, th so those aren't the publications. I don't believe are publicly shared. I'm not sure. They're, they're um, under. An, I think they're under a, an embargo period um, before they're. I think made publicly available. Yeah, I think it's a, like a year embargo or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that should not be a problem at all. And then you can use another repository, but that can't be like, you know, your departmental server because that's not a community, uh, you know, acceptable repository. It would have to be something that, um, you know, if you go to re3data.org uh, and search through the community repositories there, uh, Dryad is nice because it's relatively easy to use, but there may be some, in some cases, there are specific repositories for certain types of information like Protein Data Bank. You know, that's a publicly acceptable repository for protein structure data. And there are others that clearly might be more applicable for some types of engineering data. So th those are the types that we're talking about. But uh, not like an in-laboratory server would not be considered a public repository. Does that answer your question, Katana? Uh, absolutely, thank you. So, but I would encourage everyone to go ahead, if you publish a paper uh, that uses data in it anywhere, or you have graphics in there that are dependent upon data, uh, go ahead and make the connections with Carl and John and get those data sets into uh, you know, a repository, if not Dryad, ASAP. Uh, if you're thinking about, you know, if you're working on a paper right now and you've got data, it's not, uh, it's reasonable to go ahead and make the contacts as well. Just to uh, let John and Carl know that the, the data are coming their way very soon. Um, we will soon be reaching out to everyone that has published on EPSCoR and asking about the status of the data that underlie those various publications. So if you don't want us pestering you, uh, go ahead and make those contacts and get the, the data going into the system. This is a federal requirement. Uh, uh, officers from the uh, Office of Inspector General at NSF, they can uh, come and close down a research program. So for example, if someone has a freedom of information request, they want to see the data underlying someone's publication that was supported by NSF funds. But those data cannot be produced uh, via mechanisms like we're talking about here. Then, you know, the NSF can come in and essentially shut down research for that university. They've not done it yet, but my guess is they will be certainly looking for some scapegoats to uh, do this um, to down the road. So. Let's go ahead and be on the, the positive side of the regs here and get those data in. And it's, again, not all the data necessary to reproduce every single aspect of your research, but again, the data should be discoverable and it should allow the data to be, you know, potentially reused um, and so on. So it's not meant to be an onerous and most of the metadata required is really what's in the methods and materials section of your papers anyway. So it should be, relatively straightforward to do this. Uh, and also take advantage of the computing horsepower we have. We're really blessed to have lots of uh, high performance computing resources in New Mexico uh, that can really benefit our research. And we've got some great resources both through New Mexico State uh, as well as UNM. So we should all be uh, taking advantage of those.
And feel free to contact any of us in the state office or Carl or John or Deanna uh, if you have any further questions down the road. And unless there's anything else, I thank you all for your attendance today and uh, have a good rest of the weekend, uh, upcoming weekend.